Hello, and welcome to this week's video lecture. This week we're talking about uh, the disparate impacts of the justice system on different demographics, um, to include the false imprisonment and the uh, false convictions that occur. You know, like any organization, uh, the justice system is not infallible, and there are some some false convictions that need to be overcome. But the actual justice system itself being infallible, or soon not being infallible, you know, it does make mistakes. The the idea that it it treats some folks in America better than it treats other folks. And your book lists a lot of different demographics, and it's it is true that you know that while there are different impacts on different racial demographics, different financial demographics, uh, different regional demographics. Uh, the one I want to talk about today is the the financial demographic. There's a really interesting book. Uh, Malcolm Feely has an interesting book called "The Process Is the Punishment," and as we just in that title itself, the process is the punishment. The process of the justice system obviously is burdensome, obviously is laborious, but it should be just that. It should be a process to get to an end. The end could be acquittal which is to say the end could be you know, somebody being found not guilty, or it could be being found guilty and then coming up with some sort of punishment to accompany that, that guilty verdict. But the, the process to get there in and of itself should not be a punishment for many, many, many of us in America. The process is the punishment. Let, let's talk about a few points about our, our at least our court system. Let's talk about pretrial detention. The, the fact that when somebody is arrested, for a crime, many times they, they're taken to jail, and if they don't want to stay in jail, they have to post bail. Well, who's that going to impact the most? Those who don't have the money to post bail. You know, two, two people can be arrested, not convicted, arrested of the same crime, be given a, you know, pick a number uh, out of the air, a $20,000 bail. Uh, if you look at where, where I was involved in the court system, uh, battery. Battery had a $20,000 bail in the LA County court system. So if you were if you were arrested for battery, you could either stay in jail if you didn't have $20,000 or you could post, you know, the, the 20,000 or you could post 10% depending on the on the bail system, but essentially it's going to cost $20,000 one way or the other to get out of jail. Well, if you don't have that 20,000 or 10% of it to give to a bail bondsman, what are you going to do? Oftentimes, you just sit in jail. Look at domestic violence. If somebody's arrested for domestic violence, $50,000. Those are expensive bails. And that's going to affect somebody who doesn't have 50000 or even 5000 10%. And they're forced to sit in jail. What happens if you sit in jail and you miss work the next week or two weeks? You know, you you, you may end up losing your job. So it's going to have a you know, a different impact on that person as opposed to somebody who's got $50,000 in the bank and they can just bail out and go back home. So the financial impact is is huge. And then there's there's fees. There's fees associated with not just the bail system, but in many jurisdictions, although uh, our Miranda rights say that a, a, an attorney will be appointed for us if we cannot afford one, well, not every jurisdiction means it's going to be absolutely free. We talked about it earlier in this, this semester. The idea is sometimes the the court system will look at how much the defendant is making, how much money they have, what their wealth is, and that will determine how much the attorney costs. So if somebody has a little bit of money, but not a lot of money, they may still end up having to, end up having to pay for, for an attorney that is court appointed. Kind of like we look at that, um, that happens a lot in the educational system. When we come to qualifying for financial aid, uh, some folks, you know, parents make some money but don't make a lot of money can't afford to pay for school but really can't afford to send somebody to school either but you're in that no man's land you can't get a lot of financial aid but you also don't uh, don't have a lot of money in the bank to pay for school is the same thing can happen in the criminal justice system and then you know much along those same lines of of you know being stuck in in jail and not being able to uh, post bond and the missing work is the time and disruption you know being in court or in jail or always having to go to repeated court hearings is going to be a disruption to somebody's life. You're going to have to either miss work if they're in jail all completely or continue missing repeated days of work 
if they have to continue going to hearing after hearing after hearing, which oftentimes for these lower level offenses, it, it, it happens often. There's there's continuation, continuation after continuation after continuation of the case. The other idea is that it's just a stressful, stressful moment in somebody's life. And that moment is extended the longer that the court case is extended. The, the, the stigma of having a court case being held over somebody's head is huge. Nobody wants to admit that they have to go to court, tell their boss, tell their friends, tell the you know their co-workers, hey, I have another court case. It just reinforces the fact that they are in quote unquote trouble with society. And that stigma around them becomes heavier and heavier. If you are up for a promotion and somebody knows, hey, this guy missed a lot of work because he's got a lot of court cases, even if it's for one case and it could result in an, in an acquittal, it just hasn't yet, the process keeps dragging on. Are, are you going to give somebody a promotion who's been missing a lot of work because they're going to court? I mean, look at it from, from that perspective. It's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to ha definitely have a negative impact on, on somebody's case. And the final thing I want to talk about is the plea bargaining. If all of that takes place, the the pretrial detention burden, the the financial costs and the fees, the disruption and and time burden, the psychological stress and the stigma. If all that is going on, and somebody finally is offered a plea deal, despite the fact that they may be not guilty or factually innocent, the temptation to take that plea deal and just to have this thing over with is going to be a, a pretty tempting uh, offer to consider, especially if there's not going to be a big a uh, sentence penalty. You know, a misdemeanor case that drags on and on and on oftentimes may result in, in just a fine or time served or a suspended sentence. So what harm, quote unquote, what harm would it be to just plead guilty and get this thing over with so I'd give half my life back? And that is, I mean, that idea that the 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 punishment stems from the process instead of actually the process serving the the citizenry is a, it's a dangerous prospect and something to keep in mind as we examine the American criminal justice system. It's not perfect. I mean, we, we make it as perfect as we can, but there are definitely uh, instances wherein some folks just get treated better than others. With that, I will uh, leave you to your assignments this week. And as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Take care.